Alec, you know, help us to understand this because I, I, I will tell you, I'm so flummoxed by this. I do not understand how we have a legal system that allows us to jail people for debts. Um, and I, I will tell you my own little quick personal anecdote. I don't know about the rest of you, when I got out of college, I got a car for a graduation gift. Um, something that my mother worked very hard for. She gave me a car and I was one of those young, silly, irresponsible people who thought when meters ran out, like, what's the big deal? And I'd get tickets and, um, you know, I was struggling right out of college and I'd pay them when I could and I'd let them double and, you know, I was just really irresponsible that way. And I remember we had a friend in law enforcement who said, you know, a warrant could be put out for your arrest if you do not take care of these tickets. And I was shocked. I thought, how could I possibly go to jail for not paying parking tickets because I didn't put enough quarters in the meter when I was supposed to? Because that's what it seemed like to me. How do we live in a society where this can happen to people? And what is being done from a litigation standpoint? What options are there to challenge these kinds of systems across the country? So sure, it's, it's a real honor to be here, especially uh, to hear Kiana speak um, for the second time. The first time I heard Kiana speak was when she moved a, a whole room at the White House to tears with her uh, incredible story. And um, just privileged to be up here with you again, um, Kiana, and to talk a little bit about some of the things that, that you've gone through and that so many thousands of other human beings are going through. Uh, I think the, the easiest way to start answering your question is probably to put this into a little bit of context that you asked sort of how did we get to a legal system that allows people to be jailed, I think was how you put it, for um, not being able to pay tickets. And I think that you can't understand the answer to that question without understanding where our legal system and legal culture um, have come from over the last 20 or 30 years. And that I think the most, I think there's really two probably critical uh, components to how we've got here. One is racism. Um, so uh, this is only happening uh, because of who it's happening to. Uh, there is a, there is a, a real, uh, real sense in which the entire operation of the criminal injustice system in this country is based on creating a permanent underclass. And I think you can't understand anything about how the criminal legal system works without understanding its, its connections to the history of, of systemic uh, white supremacy and racism in this country. Um, the second, and I go into that a little bit more in a second, the, the second, I think, um, fundamental component of, of how we got here, uh, which is the thing that I deal with the most in my cases, is that somewhere along the way over the last 30 years, uh, this country has um, started to put human beings in cages at rates that are unprecedented in the recorded history of the modern world and unparalleled in our own history. So we're now putting human beings in cages at five times the steady historical average from the time of this country's founding. Uh, starting in about 1980, this stable historical average went up exponentially. And, and that sort of creation uh, that forced you know, this, this, this need to transfer human bodies from their homes and families and, and unfortunately from their cars and, and, and schools and, and churches into government-run cages of concrete and metal is uh, it's an incredible bureaucratic achievement. It requires the creation of a bureaucracy that, that needs to perpetuate itself. And one of the foundational characteristics that we've seen all around the country is that in accomplishing this transfer, so 12 or 13 million arrests every year, 2.3 million bodies in, in cages on any given night in this country now, in accomplishing that transfer, we along the way became desensitized to how brutal a thing it is to do to put another human being in a cage. And it's not just people are going somewhere away from their families uh, for a few nights or a week here and there. Um, the, the cages that we've, that we've created are grotesque torture chambers. In the city that, that Blake and, and I and others sued and got this incredible settlement that Blake was talking about, $4.75 million, we, we closed down their jail essentially um, we ended money bail there. We ended this practice of jailing people for warrants. But prior to that, you know, before we filed our lawsuit, four human beings committed suicide in that jail um, in, in the previous year uh, who were there only because they couldn't pay a few hundred dollars. And 
In Harris County, Texas, a city that I'm suing now, 55 human beings died from 2009 to 2015 just because they were too poor to pay a small amount of money to get out. Um, and so this is, and I encourage all of you to go home and, and look at the federal government statistics on um, rape and sexual assault in our jail facilities, our statistics on the communication of infectious disease in these facilities, the terrible um, food and, and, and and medical and mental health treatment that's being provided to our prisoners. These are, these are horrific places. Um, the jails in St. Louis County are among the worst places that, that um, I have ever seen in my life. And so it, 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 somewhere along the way, all of us who work in the legal system, public defenders, prosecutors, judges, we, we, we were seeing this happen so frequently and we were doing it so regularly that we stopped requiring good reasons for doing it to people. And, and, and we allowed ourselves to start caging human beings for ridiculous reasons, like that they can't come up with a few hundred dollars, or they can't make a monetary payment. That, um, that sort of what I'll call a, a pathology, that, that, that um, distortion of, of basic human understanding of what other human beings are going through, I think is at the real core of, of why we got here. Um, and, and so w what can we do about it, I think was sort of the second half of your your question and, and what legal theories are we are we uh, working on? And I think um, part of it is is the it has long been illegal to throw a human being in a cage because she can't make a payment. I mean that's that's not controversial um, Supreme Court precedent. It's in the same way that it's not controversial that nobody can be searched on the street without probable cause. Unfortunately, the Constitution is not self-executing. So if you're walking home late at night, um, and all too often um, if you're a young man of color. Um, your body can, can and will be probed by police officers without probable cause. And there's no sort of magic wand that comes down and stops that constitutional violation from happening, right? Um, it, we need civil rights lawyers. We need advocates in the community. We need people that are there to be vigilant to make sure that the Constitution isn't violated. And so um, our cases, I, I Blake may disagree, but our, our cases, and that's fine. He's a, he's a, a better lawyer than I am um, <laughs> from my perspective. Our cases often aren't about creating new law or bringing novel legal theories. You know, we're, we're dealing with really basic stuff that, that a civilization as advanced as ours should already have confronted and destroyed. Like, no human being should be put in a cage because she's poor. Um, we're actually, I think with our cases, doing something more important, more foundational. We're telling a story. We're changing the narrative about what our criminal legal system is and what it does to people. Um, it's, it's very easy to win a case. Uh, and in fact, some of these cities don't even, when they come into court, they've got nothing to say. I mean, what are you gonna say? Yes, I was caging people because they're poor, and yes, there's 10 Supreme Court cases that say I can't do that. I mean, th th these stories are instead, th these cases are instead about the stories of people like Kiana. And, and having these cases be a vehicle for telling those stories in a compelling way to judges and prosecutors, but more importantly to the rest of us in society, because all of us are complicit in creating and allowing and tolerating and perpetuating a legal system that does this kind of stuff to human beings. And so I think of our cases as successful only to the extent they contribute to a broader movement um, that changes the way we think about human caging as a society. And so um, what we're trying to do with these cases is tell a story about, about how the system is being used um, to perpetuate systemic racism, how the system is being used to fund itself, not to pursue um, so a lot of people think the criminal justice system is broken, right? They, have you ever, everyone in the audience heard that phrase, the criminal justice system is broken? Well, it's only broken if you think of its premise, its goal, as creating a society where all human beings can flourish and be safe and healthy and happy. If that's what its goal is, then yes, it's destroying lives. It's actually, not only is it broken, it's actively pursuing the wrong goals. But I actually think, if you think of the system's goal as perpetuating hierarchies of power and wealth in our society, it's actually functioning quite well. And so what our cases, I think, are trying to do is use really well-established legal theories and legal hooks to um, tell stories about what, we, what our criminal system is actually about. And only by understanding what it's actually about, um, I think, can you, can you fight it and change it? Because if you misunderstand what it's trying to do, you're going to keep banging your head on the wall because you're not going to know how to prevent it from doing what it's actually trying to do. So I hope that is kind of a vague answer to your question and not very legalistic, but I'm happy to talk about some of the legal theories in, in more depth. I know there's a lot of judges and lawyers in the audience, but I actually fundamentally think that th these cases have a, a much greater import than the particular legal doctrines that, that Blake has mastered and that we're, we're using to, to win these cases. 
Thanks, Alec. Blake, I have a question for you and then one for LB, and then I want to go back to Kiana because I want to hear much more, and I think we all do want to hear much more about what is happening on the ground in your work with other individuals who are facing these issues. So my question to you, Blake, is this. As I listen to Alec talk about the cases, if indeed uh, the, the, uh, the, the jurisdictions on the other side of these cases come to court and really have no defense, uh, why is it you're not winning all of these cases? I mean, it seems like if, if they have no defense, if they can't really stand up there and say, yes, we're jailing people and, and here's why and this is why it's defensible, how is it that we're not winning more of these cases? And then, LB, for you, I want to pick up on another point that Alec started, which is talking about the race component. Um, I'd like to hear more in terms of the research that you're doing at the Brennan Center about the connection we're seeing between race and class, mm -hmm. but also the role that geography plays in that. Um, I don't know, are we hearing about these cases all across the country? Are there just pockets of the country where this is really happening? And if so, what is the population makeup? You know, how are we able to connect the dots between where this is, in, where this is occurring and what the makeup of the population is there? So I hope everybody remembers those. <laughs> so Blake, let's start with you. Yeah, so I'll say we haven't actually lost any of these debtors prison and cash bail cases yet. <laughs> not on work. Um, so not all have been resolved yet, but we haven't actually uh, been on the losing end. And what we see more than anything, uh, some, you know, sometimes we have cities on the other side and opposing counsel who come in and very quickly understand the issues and very quickly understand that there's a problem and work with us to try to resolve it. Oftentimes, um, what we get is a lot of sort of delay and um, obfuscation of the issues and um, sort of circuitous arguments. And it's really a problem of inertia more than anything else. I mean, again, we're talking about 81 different municipal courts, at least in the St. Louis County context, basically all of which are doing some version of the same thing. So there's a, a sort of thinking like, well, we can't all be that wrong. You know, this practice that has persisted for decades in St. Louis County can't be clearly unconstitutional. We wouldn't all be doing it. Um, the answer, of course, is yes, you can, and yes, they have. But uh, it, it does sometimes just take some time to sort of break through that, that wall and get to a point um, where we can resolve the cases. You know, that's not even getting into the sort of, mod <coughs> excuse me, I've lost my voice. I was, I was shouting at a World Series game the other day. <laughs> um, without even getting into the sort of financial constraints of a lot of these are poor cities that, you know, who have insurance policies that don't want to pay money. So, you know, all of those things can just hold up final resolution. But uh, I think we actually, you know, because of the, the work of Alec around the country and others on this issue, I think we're starting to turn the tide and people really are starting to, uh, to understand um, just how big a problem this is and the need to, to make changes. So LB, help us to connect the dots. Is this a problem across the United States? Is this happening only in certain regions, in the West, in the South? And, and what, what, what are the populations of communities that make up these regions where this issue is most prevalent? What do they look like? What's the economic situation in those regions? So this is prevalent everywhere in the country. Um, in most jurisdictions, um, strangely enough, I, I live in New York City. There are five boroughs in New York City. I, I'm a former prosecutor in New York City. And judges in New York will automatically convert it to civil debt, waive the debt. You will not be jailed for this in New York City. Um, so there are pockets of jurisdictions like New York where the practice is just to waive it. You know, a, a judge will we'll automatically look at the file, not even look at the person in, in front of him or her and say, do you need it waived? Um, we have conducted what we call site visits when we visit counties um, for this project and we've interviewed judges, we've interviewed sheriffs, we've interviewed um, clerks of, of courts, we've interviewed defendants, we've interviewed prosecutors, we've interviewed public defenders, we've interviewed you know, a whole host of people in the administrative offices of the courts. A and we ask them, you know, how, how much of their day is spent on this collection practice. 
uh, in, we were recently in New Mexico and we interviewed judges there who said, people have begged me to send them to jail because they just can't pay off this debt. And I have asked them, I have authorized community service and I have said if you, if you complete 10 hours of community service, 15 hours of community service, and the judges we interviewed there said, this is the last thing we want to do. But at a certain point, um, some of them will actually just say, OK, you can go spend three or four days in jail and get rid of this debt. In New Mexico, for example, according to their state statute, their law, you can pay off your criminal justice debt um, according to you actually earn the minimum wage towards your debt for eight hours a day that you spend in jail. If you spend 24 hours in jail, you're only going to earn eight hours of that minimum wage. So let's say you owe you know, 40 hours worth of the minimum wage in debt, you're going to have to spend, I went to, you know, I'm not great at math, but four or five days in jail. And this practice is very common. This practice, um, we're working in Texas, that's common in Texas, in New Mexico. Um, in terms of the populations, this is only impacting people who are very poor. Um, who are indigent, and unfortunately, um, this, is, this is much more prevalent in communities with high populations of um, Latinos and African Americans. Um, it, the state statutes may be written uh, in a very objective way, but what happens in practice is that if you, if you can afford it, you're just paying this off. Um, it's no big deal. If you can't afford it, let's say you're given probation, you may be on probation one year, two year, three years longer than someone else who paid it off within their first month of probation. Um, it's a condition of probation. So if you're not meeting this condition, your probation is extended. And then what happens? You're in the net longer. So if you fail a drug test, if you happen to forget that you're supposed to meet with your probation officer, if you happen to forget that you're supposed to go to some 24, you know, uh, seven dads program, you can start to get revoked because of this um, three years later. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen what happens in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, um, the, the city decided, you know what, we're in a huge financial crunch right now. Thousands of people in the city owe debt. Let's go find them. And so in Philadelphia, debt collectors knocked on doors of people who had had no contact with the criminal justice system for dozens of years, and the paperwork was all wrong. So they were knocking on doors of people who they thought owed the debt, who didn't owe the debt. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a disaster. Um, but unfortunately, this, you know, this, this doesn't impact um, wealthy um, individuals. Thanks, LB. Kiana, I, I want to go back to you. Tell us in, in more detail about some of the work that you are now doing as an advocate. Um, you have real person, firsthand experience working with this issue, but tell us how you are able to assist others who are facing similar issues, and tell us what can be done from an advocate, advocacy perspective to try uh, and help bring about some improvements with respect to the fees and fines issue. <coughs> See a lot of the uh, clients that come in. They okay. have. Yeah, pull the microphone over. Okay. They have. They have. Um, a lot of them have cases that that are very much like mine. Um, it's good that the you know the attorney that um, the organization that I'm with now that they understand that the issues are span a, a whole person's life. Um, you know, from their family to their housing, and it's not just the legal issue. And to look at the whole person, whenever I would go before a judge, I wasn't given the opportunity to explain why I hadn't paid or why I missed a court date. You know, it was just a calculator tallying up how much I owed mm -hmm. the courts. So to, to be able to hear hear out the person is it would would help it would help a lot um, I can see the um, 
I can see that aspect of our clients, whether or not they have, you know, a place to stay or food. The, I guess the insight into that is helpful to the organization. Um, being able to have that, um, to take care of things before, so that the legal issues can be taken care of. Um, it's like a, a holistic, that is exactly what it is, a holistic care. Um, a lot of times their issues are more compounded because, uh, more than mine, because drugs or alcohol and things like that are involved. And however, there, there, there are drug courts and things like that. But in my situation, that didn't apply to me, so there was no special court for just pover poverty, not having the ability to pay. Um, so I guess to take that into consideration, to accept um, the time that I spent in jail as payment. I feel like I paid, you know, maybe five or six times for each traffic ticket um, <clears throat> with the time that I spent in jail and the monies that I did pay. So to take all of those things into, into consideration, you know, a person's, a person's time is, is worth something as well. Um, is it, did I answer everything? You absolutely did. Um, but if there's anything else you want to add, you, you can, because I'm, then I'm going to ask Blake a question, really about how do you, in your work, Blake, utilize and mobilize clients uh, like Kiana, um, the people who have firsthand experience? How, how is that part of the strategy uh, to really bring about some, some impactful change? Sure. I'm glad you asked that because Kiana is, as usual, being characteristically modest. The truth is that she has, just by speaking to people, just by going to events, sitting on panels, doing interviews with folks, she has inspired and encouraged so many other people that have experienced similar things to reach out to our office, to share their stories, um, to, to some of them act as plaintiffs in, in lawsuits uh, against additional cities. Um, and I think that's because a lot of people for, for years have sort of, there's a shame attached to having been put through um, these really harrowing experiences. And folks have been made to feel that they did something horribly wrong because why else would you sit in jail for days or weeks or even months on some occasions? Um, and when they hear someone like Kiana share her experience and um, share how she's worked through it and, and now working with our city defenders trying to um, make a change, you know, that really has inspired a lot of people. Uh, so one thing that we ask of really all of our clients is um, that, you know, not all of them are Kiana, not all of them are comfortable sitting in front of a room and talking about what happened to them, uh, but, but that they sort of join, um, join us in helping to spread the word about what's happening to people. I mean, as Alex said, a lot of this really is about helping to uh, spread the, the narratives of people like Kiana, helping to show what's actually happening to people on the ground on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, that is, it's so critical to everything that we do, you know, if the, the second that we stop hearing from our clients that these things are happening and we hear about something else, then, then our work will change. You know, we're driven by what we hear from the people that come into our office every day. And so, uh, you know, Kiana has been really, really uh, impactful in this area and, and we rely on all of our clients um, to, to drive our work in that way.